Let me thank Bansi for not only calling me, but almost 30 of my colleagues from UDF. Thank you so much. Thank you for that gesture. Gujarat and Mumbai will always be close. Uh, so I'm going to talk about something new. And it is new, so all my questions should be directed to the person who sent me the slide deck. That is Rucha Mehta. She's done a lot of research on this. So insulin signaling and insulin resistance are new understandings. So uh, we had uh, Dr. Mathur speak about how exercise can improve uh, uh, the beta cell function. I'm just going to give you a, a little bit uh, thought process into what actually happens. And we have heard about the ominous octate. We have heard about how fat cell accelerated lipolysis, how GI, GI and how paradoxical hyperglucagonemia is a defect in people with diabetes. What I'm going to talk about that we heard about the legacy effect uh, almost a decade and a half back and we thought that probably it was related to the mitochondrial changes. Now when we talk about mitochondria and diabetes, the first thought which comes into our mind is the mitochondrial DNA mutations. And there are 13 to 14 of them. And importantly, we know that there is melas, there is maternal inherited uh, diabetes with deafness. But mitochondrial dysfunction seems to be the core problem in diabetes and whether we can tweak this mitochondrial dysfunction to the benefit of people with type 2 diabetes is the basis of my talk. So I am not an expert in this. I am trying to do my best to kind of make a complex pathophysiological defect in a much simpler manner. Insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction leads to all the issues, whether it's hyperglycemia, endothelial dysfunction, enhanced lipolysis, the Randall cycles, enhanced uh, hyperglucagonemia, increased gl hepatic gluconeogenesis, and the beta cell apoptosis, which we spoke about in the previous lecture. So all this go in sync and chronic hyperglycemia sets in. Metabolic inflexibility and mitochondrial dysfunction seems to be at the root of all these problems. They could be genetic factors like the uh, mitochondrial DNA mutations, common genetic variants, environmental factors, uh, the intrauterine malnutrition environment. Uh, uh, I remember Dr. N.K. Singh speaking about environmental pollutants and beta cell dysfunctions related to the mitochondrial dysfunction. So what happens in the beta cell? You have beta cell failure, you have ab abnormal fusion, fission, and autophagy of the mitochondria, and you have increased insulin resistance, which finally leads to type 2 diabetes. Now, the heart of the matter is this beta cell dysfunction, where you have a reduced reuptake and you have increased hepatic gluconeogenesis, leading to what is called as beta cell dysfunction. And this seems to be coming out or, or, or boring out, from, born from the mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial mitophagy, as it is called. So, if, if I take you back to Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, you can enter. Uh, if, you t if I take you back to our glucose homeostasis, we know that uh, aerobic glycolysis occurs and then you enter the TCA cycle. You could also enter the TCA cycle through fatty acid oxidation and then you have generation of ATP, ADP, which is the powerhouse or the energy of every cell. This occurs in every aerobic prokaryotic uh, cells in our body and this is the way that the mitochondrial functions it provides energy to the cells and then you, this NADH and FADH2 enters the electron transport chain you it goes through the 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 the, the complex 2 and complex 3 goes through if it goes through complex 1 you have reactive oxygen species which is made if it goes through 2 and 3 and 4 you have ATP generation and that's how the the energy occurs in a cell. So you can have energy being made. If you have abnormal metabolism, you, you can have reactive oxygen species which can call apoptosis. At the recent American Diabetes Association meeting, there was a fantastic banting lecture which spoke about how the glucokinase gene can be tweaked into a counterintuitive gene. And we have always looked at glucokinase activators being treatment for diabetes. But this particular research for 40 years spoke about how chronic hyperglycemia can cause excess entry of glucose into the cell through the glucokinase gene and that leads to glycogen 
deposition in the beta cell. As we had heard five years back that one gram of fat deposition in the beta cell can cause diabetes. Similarly, excess glucose influx can cause glycogen deposition leading to diabetes. Similarly, so if we can tweak the glucokinase gene as we have glucokinase related uh, monogenic diabetes and that is the hypothesis that if we can tweak the glucokinase gene into a counterintuitive gene which allows only that much of influx into the glucose in spite of chronic hyperglycemia you will not have glycogen deposition in the beta cell and your beta cell will not progress into apoptosis and into failure. So that's the basis of the meta metabolic inflexibility which seems to be the heart of the matter. So, so mitochondrium and, uh, is involved in all these uh, processes. Metabolic inflexibility refers to the dysregulated energy substrate metabolism in the mitochondria. Healthy mitochondria allow efficient functioning of the hepatic, skeletal muscle, pancreas and cardiac tissues. There needs to be an alternating switching of metabolic fuel which is lost during chronic fat or carbohydrate feed obesity and type 2 diabetes. So the, the, the switching which needs to occur based on the availability of substrate seems to be the problem as such. So when you have, when you have fasting or feeding states, the glucose homeostasis is very well maintained by the glucose substrates or the free fatty acid substrates. And in a healthy individual, lean, non-insulin resistant individual, there's a continuous alternation of fuel which occurs. We, we, you know, when we treat type 1 diabetes and who are into a lot of exercises, you may realize that there are so much X carbs we need to add. There's a lot of sprint, aerobic activities, which causes a lot of alternation of fuels. And that can cause, sometimes you may see that uh, activity actually increases blood sugar and can cause ketosis. That's because of the inflexibility of our, our beta cells to change based on the substrate available. So in type 2 diabetes and, obes and obesity, the same thing occurs. You have increased free fatty acids, increased fuel substrate, which uh, the electron transport chain goes into the complex one. And you have increased reactive uh, 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 nitrogen stress. And that's why you get minimal mitophagy and your in decrease in ATP-ADP ratio which results in decreased insulin sensitivity and finally beta cell apoptosis. So this is what happens when you have reduction in mitochondrial pyruvate which comes from lipid oxidation. You have decreased substrate utilization for ATP generation, reduced glucose entry and endothelial dysfunction which can lead to complications, hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia and hypertension. So mitochondrial dysfunction is, seems to be the basis and accounts for both skeletal and muscle insulin resistance and also to the impaired beta cell insulin secretion. So long time exposure to glucose and free fatty acids surpasses this adaptive threshold of switching because our pancreatic beta cells cannot switch and leading to decrease in ATP and further vascular complications. So if you look at this, this is what happens in most of our organs and mitochondrial dysfunction occurs across organ systems in people with diabetes. And what we are talking about is a new drug. A new drug which comes to the face called imaglim. It's got a dual action on insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. What it does is that it reduces the reactive oxygen species which can cause oxidative stress. It reduces the liver hepatic gluconeogenesis and it increases the glucose stimulated uptake in the skeletal muscle. So in, in short, it takes care of the core problems which are related to insulin secretory defect and improves uh, uh, in, uh, in, insulin resistance and thus improve glucose homeostasis. So um, I'm not going into a lot of detail of how imp imaglim impacts insulin secretion, but it helps us to provide different substrates. This metabolic or mitochondrial disflexibility which is there is changed because of imaglim and it increases the ATP-ADP ratio. It changes the substrate which is available for going into the electron transport chain and that's why a cation transport occurs through complement C and 2 and not through complement 1. 
because of which you have reduction in oxidative stress. So beta cell apoptosis or beta cell dysfunction is lesser. Your increase complements three activity, increase NAD, increase potassium ATP closure, increase calcium ref, uh, influx, and better insulin release from the beta cell. Similarly, it amplifies the cellular energetics pathway to improve insulin sensitivity. In the same way, you have increased glucose transport and increased in insulin sensitivity. So this is how it, it occurs in all the cells that there is mitochondria, the, all the prokaryotic cells which actually breathe. You have this occurring where, where, where it reduces the oxidative stress. It manages the equilibrium between energy uh, and energetics because it helps what is called as the mitochondrial bioenergetics. It, it, it improves the nutrient substrate utilization at complex 3. That's why you have redu reduction in oxidative stress. So if you look at the action, it, its main action is on better insulin re release, gluconeogenesis, and also it also reduces oxidative stress. Now whether it has an insulin independent action or the action on the periphery has a cause and effect on the beta cell, we still have to actually find that out. We still don't know exactly how the drug acts. But imaglim, if you compare it to metformin, that's where the comparison will come. And once I share the data, it's, it has an impact on the mitochondrial electron transport chain. It has an impact on potassium ATP closure. It has an impact on insulin secretion, inhibition of the hepatic glucose output, and it improves insulin sensitivity. It also has, has a role to play in the bioenergetics, which metformin doesn't have. So again, it addresses both beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance, unlike metformin. So your triple actions are that improved beta cell function, you have a reduction in hepatic gluconeogenesis, and increased peripheral glucose uptake in the skeletal muscle. So mode of action is quite different from all other OADs for its effects. This is in comparison of imaglim to metformin, not getting into details of it. So you have some phase three studies, which I'm going to show. Uh, smaller studies, as you can see, 24, 52 weeks, and 52 weeks, and a smaller number of subjects, totally around 1,200 people. If you look at HbA1c reduction, uh, you can see anywhere between 0.4 to 0.87 reduction in this phase three randomized control trial. So if you look at times one, which is a phase three study in Japan, it's met as primary and key secondary endpoint. Phase three was a randomized double-blind placebo control study to evaluate the efficacy and safety and tolerability of imaglim in patients. It is, uh, what it showed is that it showed a statistically significant reduction as monotherapy in 0.87% reduction in HbA1c in patients as compared to placebo at the end of 24 weeks, 1000 milligram BID. So if you look at baseline democratic seems to be the same. So 0.87% uh, reduction and again was consistent with the phase 2b results. A lot of patients achieved their HbA1c consistent across efficacy even in patients with chronic kidney disease up to 3a that is up to 45 eGFR. Again, if you look at its phase two study, which was an open label time two parallel group that assessed the long-term safety of imaglim in patients with type two diabetes, this was as an add-on to other therapy. So whether you add on to any other therapy, you see that is a, it showed a good reduction in HbA1c from almost 0.56 to 0.92 with imaglim as an add-on to several existing oral hypoglycemic therapy. If you look at time, uh, times three, which was again a 16-week double-blind placebo-controlled randomized tri trial in patients who were taking insulin and type 2 diabetes, it showed a 0.64 reduction at 36 weeks, 0.54 at the end of 52 weeks. So again, the HbA1c uh, was statistically uh, re reduced in all three studies as monotherapy, as add-on to any other oral anti-diabetic, and also add on to insulin. Again, you have a meta-analysis which got published last year and it again looks at it that amiglim kind of addresses both HbA1c and fasting plasma glucose in treatment naive or uncontrolled patients. 
So Imeglim has again very good safety profile. You have very, very little differences, very, very little adverse events, very minimal adverse events, and was similar between both the groups. If you look at uh, comparison with major other therapeutic class, you will see that the HbA1c reduction is very close to a DPP-4 or a metformin, but the action profile seems to be very, very different for imeglim as such. So the highlights are that mitochondrial dysfunction seems to lead to beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance. Mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin signaling defect leads to endothelial dysfunction. Mitochondrial dysfunction accounts for both skeletal muscle insulin resistance and impaired pancreatic cell insulin secretion. Imeglim improves insulin resistance and insulin secretory defect by modulation of mitochondrial function to improve glucose homeostasis. It amplifies the, the mitochondrial bioenergetics pathway to improve insulin sensitivity. It reduces the oxidative stress on the mitochondria. Hence, it's a potential drug for management of diabetes and its role as monotherapy and combination is supported by RCTs. Thank you all for a patient hearing.